Hey, glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. We always start off with exhortation and exaltation, exalting the Lord for the praise and glory and honor that is due and owing to him. We do that with the fruit of our lips by proclaiming how good God is. We do that with the clapping of our hands. We do that audibly and expressively, outwardly to show God and the rest of the world just how much he means to us and that we truly do belong to him. Because we say it all the time, you know by the way you act and the way you talk and the way you treat people, you're showing the world who you belong to. Make sure that you're showing the world the right family representation. Amen? Hey, with that, we say greetings. Thank you for joining us on our Tuesday night online church services where we give all glory to God for what he is doing through this is Global Church Body Alliance, and as we normally like to do, we begin, of course, by extending hellos and welcomes and salutations to our beautiful, beloved, majestic sister church, the best church on this side of heaven, as Pastor Pipkin likes to say. Oasis on the Mount, Church and Healing Center in Garland, Texas, led by the aforementioned Pastor Chris Pippin. Greetings, Oasis. Love y'all. Appreciate y'all. Um, always so grateful when y'all fellowship with us. We encourage you out there. Go to their Facebook page. Go to their website. The links to both of those in their chat are in the chat right now. Go to their Facebook page and their website. Check out everything that they've got going on. And check out their Sunday morning services, which you can watch any time of the week. Of course, you can watch it on Sunday, 9.30 Eastern, 8.30 Central, on the Facebook page of Oasis on the Mount Church and Healing Center. Or it replays after that all throughout the week on that same Facebook page. Make sure you support them. We love Oasis. They are our family, our brothers and sisters. So when you support us, you support them. Shout out to Oasis. We love y'all. Also, shout out to all of our sister ministries around the world. Welcome to our beloved followers in Pakistan, and India, and Africa, and Europe, whether it's Germany or the UK or Switzerland. Shout out to everybody around the world that cares about Benevolent Faith Ministries. We are so grateful and thankful for you. Many of you we may never see in this lifetime, but God sees you. God sees our union. And I believe he's pleased with our union. So he's gonna bless our union. And we thank you for being a part of a union that he blesses. Friends, that said, we also encourage you to spread the word about this Tuesday night online church service. Hit that invite button. Invite somebody to come out. I mean, we just started, right? Like, yo, Tuesday night, 7 p.m. They get in, they get out, they get on with their lives. It's only an hour. If it goes over an hour, it's probably important. But for the most part, they don't go over an hour. Let them know that. And let them know the service replays on Wednesday on the same platform at 1 Eastern, noon uh, Central, 10 a.m. Pacific. And that they can watch it on our YouTube page anytime. Just go to our YouTube page and see everything we've ever done. And the link to that is in the chat right now as well. Hey, check it out. You know what time it is. That's right. Time for this week's announcements, my friends. It's here, a world with amazing adventures and Christian messaging your kids will love. Introducing TruePlay, multiple games in one app, a safe and trusted platform. Go to TruePlayGames.com today to learn more. Amen, amen. Listen, don't forget our 2024, not summer, we've extended it for the rest of the year. 2024 campaign, giving campaign, which we've entitled Operation Feed the World. We are getting the gospel and food to people in third world countries and other countries where it's just poor. And they're disadvantaged and they're under, underprivileged, underprivileged. And so your dollars are going a long way toward not only feeding them, but also getting them Bibles and other things that will help them be educated 
by the gospel of Christ. And we've posted pictures and videos all summer long associated with this campaign and the work that your money is going towards directly, including the establishment of educational centers in both India and Pakistan, where kids are learning for the first time. This is going to continue, y'all. We're going to continue doing this. And we ask you to please continue consider giving to our Operation Feed the World campaign. It's very important. Very, very important. And we appreciate everybody that has given so far and continue to support this endeavor that impacts the lives of millions of people around the world in countries where the hope of the gospel is transforming lives every single day. Thank you. Also, don't forget, download that True Play Games app so that you can hook your kids up and your neighbor's kids and your nieces and nephews and all the children you know with quality Christian-based video games. Whether they play it on a tablet or on a console, wherever they want to play it. Really, it's on a tablet because it's an app, I should say. <laughs> but True Play, man, it's such a great app. And all these games out here with the violence and the cussing and the nudity and all the stuff that's in video games, okay? I don't know if y'all have ever played Call of Duty, but there'd be some crazy stuff in there that little eight, nine-year-olds don't really need to be seeing, but they do. Instead, hook them up with the True Play Games app so that they can play some wholesome games and so that you can get paid for it because, as you know, every person you refer to True Play that downloads it, you get $25. So download the True Play Games app today, trueplaygames.com. Become a member of the True Play affiliate program. Get your money. Hey man, shout out to True Play. But tonight, my friends, y'all, tonight we're going to be starting something that we've never done before on this Tuesday night platform, but which I've wanted us to do for a few years now. Just had to wait for the right time. This seems like the right time. And that's that we're going to start a short study series related to a specific topic. So every sermon during this series will be associated with that topic. And that topic, my friends, is the topic of prayer. Prayer is so important to our walk with Christ. It's so vital to our spiritual health and our well-being that you can never study or learn enough about it. Point blank. As a believer, you are not going to survive in this world if you don't pray frequently and consistently. Period. Prayer is our communicative hotline to God. It's how we speak with him every day. Accordingly, if you're trying to have a relationship with Christ, then failing to communicate with him or the Father is not going to foster a lot of success in that relationship. Think about it. You really like somebody. You want to get to know them. But you don't call them. You don't go see them. You don't even talk to them. But in your mind, you've delusionally come up with this idea that that's my girlfriend, that's my boyfriend. I really care for them. They don't know you. You ain't never said not one word to them. Same premise. We can call ourselves loving God and being believers and all this stuff. But if we're not communicating with God on a consistent basis, if we're not talking to him, talking to Christ on a consistent basis, how are we exactly in a relationship? With him. Doesn't make sense. Can't be in a relationship with somebody you don't talk to. So we want to take the next two weeks to highlight different aspects of prayer, which stress its importance, significance, and impact in our lives. And we're going to do this as part of a very short study series that we have entitled, Let Us Pray. And so, for this first message in this series, Let Us Pray, the scripture passage, which is going to guide our discussion as we kick off the series, is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 20. I'm going to read this from the New Living. Actually, I'm going to read this from the English Standard Version. Normally, I read from the NLT. I'm going to read this from the ESV. And the word of the Lord reads as follows. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power and work within us. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Tonight, my friends, as we begin our new series, 
entitled, Let Us Pray. I want to speak from the subject, Prayer Barriers. Prayer Barriers. Let's look to the Lord. Father God in heaven, what a glorious day you've made. Not because of anything in particular, just because you made it. Anything your hand touches is glorious. And so we thank you for making this glorious day. We thank you for being a part of um, our lives in a glorious way. We thank you for allowing us to glorify your church. We thank you for allowing us to see your glory in our fellowship. We thank you, Lord, that it is your glorious nature that we succumb to and that we follow with all of our hearts and with all obedience. And Lord, we know that sometimes when we reach out to you, the things we ask for, they don't get answered. The prayers we send up to you don't have a return as we send them. Lord, help us tonight to learn why that's the case. Why sometimes the prayer barriers to our prayers being heard come from us and no other source. Help us to improve our prayer lives so that we can improve our communication with you, so that we can improve our walk with Christ. Hallelujah to your name, Lord. What you're going to do here today. In the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Because you and you alone are our rock and redeemer. We just ask for the spirit of the living God. Fall fresh and new this day, Lord. Have your way here in this place and in everyone's heart who's listening right now. In Jesus' name, we pray that if your heart out there say amen, amen, and amen. Prayer barriers from the Let Us Pray study series. Now, when I say that and when you say that, I want y'all to do that too. Hey, don't you go to that Tuesday night church service? What are you guys doing right now? Oh, right now, Pastor Rob is in this study series called let us pray. <laughs> you got to make sure you pray hands, right? I'm just saying. And of course, a barrier is anything that prevents you from doing something. For instance, if there is a barrier in the road, it prevents you from driving and going forward. Someone's criminal past can be a barrier to them getting the type of job they want. Because if you're a felon, you're not getting certain jobs. Yada, yada, yada. Well, as you can probably guess from this message title, there can also be barriers to our prayer life. Stuff that gets in the way of us not only praying, but of us are having our prayers heard by God. And before we even get all into the discussion associated with prayer barriers, we need to establish something off the bat here, my friends. And that's that God only hears genuine prayers. Hear me on this? God only hears genuine prayers. He only honors sincere prayers from prostrate hearts. That means hearts that are submissive to him. So people who pray with hidden agendas, people who pray with deceptive hearts, people who pray with secret intentions of being all up in the video, I just have to throw that anywhere. No, nah, God doesn't hear the prayers from those type of people. And listen, that's not me being judged. You know, that comes from Jesus himself. Jesus taught that genuine prayer involves going to God in private. His exact words were, quote, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. That's Matthew chapter six, verse six. Jesus was saying, make it a one-on-one -on -one affair, a personal and intimate conversation between you and your creator. You know what he wasn't saying? He wasn't saying don't pray in public. Because I got into a debate with one of my former classmates about this very thing. She was like, Matthew 6, 6 makes it clear we're not supposed to pray in public. No, that's not what that is saying. Remember, context, learn your Bible, people. Anyway, Jesus was saying that when you pray, don't be all grandiose with it. Showy, showmanship, showing off for other people. Just pray to your father and keep it pushing. Look at Matthew 6, 7. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. 
Don't be like them. Jesus was like, look, you don't need to put on a show or an act in order to get God's attention with your prayers. You don't like that. You want to get his attention with your prayers? Live righteously. Treat people well. That'll get his attention. Now, the other stuff, you don't care about that stuff. Instead, Jesus teaches us that God is eager to hear the prayers of his people and know their needs before they ask for them. Now, again, that's only what it says. His people, understand what that means. You are not one of God's people if you are not obedient to God. See what I'm saying? Because that goes back to that point. We're all God's creation. We're not all God's children. God created all of us. But we're not all God's children. He's not all of our father. Because that's a relationship situation. See that? So, we need to give genuine prayers and only those type of prayers all the time. It's genuine prayer that Paul is talking about to the Thessalonians when he tells them in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 to, quote, pray without ceasing. Don't stop getting get it. It's genuine prayer that Paul is talking about to the Colossians when he tells them in Colossians 4, chapter 2, or chapter 4, verse 2, to, quote, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And the word steadfast basically means unwavering, resolute, faithful, dedicated. Don't stop, get it, get it. See? But I want y'all to give consideration to something, okay? Think about this. In both of those verses, we see Paul instructing his readers not to stop praying. Both of those verses, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 and Colossians 4.2. He's telling them to continue fervent prayer to God to not stop praying. Meaning that in instructing his readers not to stop praying, it's obvious that the Apostle Paul took it for granted that they had been praying already in the first place. You can't stop doing something you weren't already doing, right? Like if you walk into a room and somebody immediately says, dude, why are you talking so much? Shut up. Your reaction is going to be like, oh, uh, what are you talking about? I never said a word. In fact, I just walked in the room, right? So you cannot stop doing something you weren't already doing. So that's the idea behind Paul telling them, make sure y'all keep on praying fervently. That assumes that y'all have already been praying fervently. You can't keep praying fervently if you haven't already been doing it. See that? And that brings us to our text this evening, y'all. Ephesians 3.20. Let's read it again. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power and work within us. Now, I want us to note what this text is truly saying. What the Apostle Paul is really trying to tell us here, y'all. First, he tells us that God is, quote, able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. In other words, God has the capacity to accomplish so much more than we could ever possibly imagine. But then look at the next part of what Paul says in the text. According to the power and work within us. Meaning God only goes above and beyond on our behalf according to the power at work within us. So what does that mean exactly? What is this power Paul is speaking about? Well, Paul is talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. And he's telling us that the power of the Holy Spirit has to be active in people before the power of God can work in their favor, right? Doesn't that make sense? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is indwelt within every believer once they accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. And it is the Spirit of God solely and exclusively which gives us access to his supernatural power working within us. That means that we need to seek to continuously be filled with the Spirit. And you cannot be continually filled with the Spirit 
if you're filling yourselves up with things which are opposed to the spirit. And because I want y'all to understand this completely and fully, this example I'm getting ready to give might be somewhat simplistic, but think of it like this. You got a cell phone, right? You want it to work, but it's on 1%. So you got to charge it up first. So you got to plug it in, plug the charger into the phone, plug the charger other end of it into the wall. But the problem is that there's no battery inside the cell phone. So no matter how long you leave it plugged up, it's not going to work. It's not going to have any juice because it doesn't have a battery inside of it. The battery is what makes it active and what makes it go. The charger cord is what gives it its power. Because when the battery dies, you can recharge the battery using the cord. But if there's no battery, you ain't recharging nothing. If this phone didn't have a battery in it, I could leave it on a charger for three weeks. It would blow up, explode, or nothing because there's no battery in it. It'd be completely harmless. It's not charging anything at all, right? But if the battery's in here and I leave this plugged up for two weeks, it might blow up and start a fire and burn the house down, right? My point is that this is the same premise when it comes to the Holy Spirit, y'all. The Holy Spirit is the battery and prayer is the charger. You plug into the power of God through the charger. But if his spirit isn't already in you, that's the battery, then you're not going to be able to effectively plug into his power. Does that make sense? Therefore, if the power of God is not at work in the life of a believer, then it's quite possible that the believer has created a hindrance or a barrier to the Spirit of God being able to work within that believer. And that includes your prayers not being heard or answered by God. In other words, we can do, say, or participate in actions and ways of thinking which preclude the Spirit of God from working effectively within us and accordingly which create barriers to God here in our prayers. That is, we can literally get in our own way, y'all, and block our own prayers from being heard. And there is plenty of biblical precedents for this ideology scattered throughout both the Old and the New Testaments, where God gives us clear warnings and statements as to how prayers are hindered and barriers are created to them being heard. Now, from an Old Testament standpoint, just look at Psalm 66, verse 18. If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Proverbs 21, 13. Those who shut their ears to the cries of the poor will be ignored in their own time of need. Isaiah 59, 2. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. And then, from a New Testament standpoint, consider Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifices to God. That's Jesus saying, look, if you're in the altar getting ready to pray and you realize that you hold a grudge against somebody, you better go reconcile that before you pray to God. Because with that grudge on your heart, he ain't going to hear you, right? Look at Matthew 11, verses uh, 25. Um, excuse me, Mark chapter 11, verse 25. Mark eleven twenty-five. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. That's also Jesus talking. It was so important, he repeated it. Like, look, before you pray, you holding grudges and all that stuff, you got to let that go before you come before God because he's showing up going to be like, how you coming before me with your request and you're holding grudges against this person over here? Oh, he's going to point it out and your prayers will not be answered. That's a hindrance to your prayers. Friends, all of these passages of scripture that we just read, 
They teach us that there are specific things that hinder and block our prayers and that there are conditions that have to be met if our prayers are going to be effective. So that's what we're going to focus on for the rest of our time here, y'all, which is very short. We're going to examine the things that become prayer barriers to us. That is, the barriers which, one, keep us from praying at all, and then number two, which keep our prayers from succeeding. So there are prayer barriers that keep us from praying at all, and there are prayer barriers that keep the prayers that we do make from being successful. So let's look at the first element. And that's why I read each of those passages of text, by the way, because cumulatively, they paint the broad picture of the hindrances to our prayer lives, which work to keep us from praying without ceasing. So here's the first element, and that relates to the things which keep us from praying overall, the barriers that hinder us from praying. For example, spiritual carelessness hinders prayer. Whenever we allow ourselves to become spiritually slack or careless to where we don't execute God's commands as frequently or sharply or consistently, we're not listening to them. We live in trifling. We're being disobedient. We're being rebellious. Then our prayers lack the proper power and effectiveness needed for them to be fulfilled. When we start slacking off on our own prayer lives, then we should reasonably expect that God will not hear and honor our prayers. If you're not praying fervently and consistently, you praying once a week, what makes you think God's going to hear that? Remember, we said relationship. That's not a relationship. That's not communication, right? Think of it like an absentee father. Never comes around, never comes to get the kids, take them anywhere. But he stops by every now and then, he drops off some money. And he thinks that that is sufficient for him as a father, that that is enough and that should be sufficient for him, right? When the reality is he needs to be there full time and be a father to those kids because that money don't mean nothing. And that relationship is not fostered and built through the one time giving of money. It's built through him coming to get them consistently and taking them out. Same thing with God. You want a relationship with him, it's got to be consistent, okay? And if it's not, then your prayers are not going to be answered. When we start slacking off in our prayer lives, y'all, it don't make sense to think God's going to hear us. Because the reality is that whenever you lack the desire to pray, then you shouldn't be upset or surprised if God lacks the desire to hear your prayers. I don't want to pray. Well, then why should God honor your prayer when you do? You're praying when it's convenient for you. Maybe God will answer your prayer when it's convenient for him. You see how that doesn't exactly work for the Lord? Don't be surprised if God don't hear your prayers. Chronicles 16, 11 says, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. That means that spiritual carelessness is unacceptable. That means that consistency and persistence should be earmarks of not only your Christian walk, but of your prayer life. Both of which stem from what? Your level of intentionality. Okay? You want to be consistent. You want to be persistent. You got to want to be consistent and persistent. You got to be motivated to do it. That is, how regularly and often you pray is solely a matter of your efforts to do so. Anybody stopping you from praying but you and your own efforts. So if you aren't doing that, if you aren't praying consistently and with persistence, then once again, you should reasonably anticipate that your prayers will be hindered and go unanswered. And slacking off spiritually, spiritual carelessness, also can include being indifferent to the word of God. Being indifferent to the word of God, friends, reading God's word stimulates and encourages prayer. It's also where we get our marching orders from. You want to live righteously and live Christ-like? How do I do that? Read your word. That's where it tells you how to do that. 
So if we're unwilling to listen to the Lord and obey his commands, then it follows that our prayers become an abomination to him. You don't want to listen to me. I ain't going to listen to you. Proverbs 28, 9 says it this way. God detests the prayers of a person who ignores the law. Proverbs, let's make it pretty, pretty clear. You don't want to do what God says. He ain't going to listen to you when you pray. When your life is filled with busyness, you crowd out the word of God. And accordingly, you crowd out prayer. Because people can get so busy that there is little or no time left for reading God's word or for praying. Friends, we need to be aware of the barrenness of busy life. Barrenness, empty, barren. What I'm saying is a busy life, being busy, creates activity, but it's ultimately an empty endeavor. Ultimately, Again, it comes down to intentionality. It comes down to setting your mind to purposefully, on purpose, do things to deliberately glorify God in your life. Failure to do so reasonably results in unanswered prayers. Doesn't that make sense? Think of it in another simple term. Your kid wants their allowance. Your kid won't do their chores. You tell your kid, you don't do your chores, you ain't getting no allowance. Every time you ask for an allowance without washing them dishes or cutting the grass or whatever, I'm going to ignore you like you're not even talking to me. Same premise. Every time you don't listen to me, do what my word instructs you to do, do what my son told you to do as his followers in Christ likeness. Every time you do that, I ain't listening to nothing you pray to me about. I don't care if you call yourself a holy roller. I don't care if it's a whole church of y'all. I ain't listening. We saw that in the book of Amos, right? God's like, don't play with me. So we've examined the first element of prayer barriers or hindrances to prayer, which relates to the barriers that hinder us from praying, the stuff that keeps us from praying in the first place. Finally, and I'm done, y'all, let's look at the second and final element here, which relates to the barriers that keep our prayers from succeeding. So there are the barriers that keep us from praying at all, then there's the barriers that keep the prayers that we do offer from succeeding, that keep God from hearing them and answering them. Because look, the reality is this. Sometimes when we pray and it's clear that those prayers likely won't be answered, we need to understand that it's not that God doesn't want to answer those prayers and give us what we're asking for. Sometimes the problem is with us. Sometimes we get in our own way based on our actions or the positions or stances that we take. Many times when we fail to gain the answers to our prayers, it may be due to a number of factors, a number of prayer barriers that are preventing our prayers from succeeding. And I want to cover a couple of them. We're not going to do an exhaustive list. There's no way we could. There was no way we could do an exhaustive list list of the prayer barriers that um, keep us from praying. I just did two of them. There are many others, but we'd be here all night, and I know y'all ain't trying to do that. So we're just going to cover a couple of them. And here's one, something that prevents our prayers from succeeding, and that's a worldly spirit. A worldly spirit hinders prayer and keeps it from succeeding. If our affections are so set on earthly things that we start neglecting heavenly and spiritual things, then we're going to lose interest in prayer. And we're even going to reach the point where we don't feel the need to pray. When you're satisfied with worldly stuff and you're happy with that, you don't need to reach out to God. You have everything you need right here. You don't need to reach out to him. So you certainly aren't going to pray to him. Because the things, and you with a worldly mindset, the things you're going to pray for, you already got. You already got that stuff. So pray to him for what? You see what I'm saying? Remember, as a follower of Christ, you do not have a worldly spirit any longer. Your spirit is different. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 14 puts it this way. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, 
so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it. For those, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry, I got to say this. Every time you hear a person say, I'm not a Christian, I don't believe in Jesus, I believe in God, I'm spiritual. Ooh, you hear that a lot, don't you? First of all, that ain't nothing but somebody's excuse to not live Christ-like because it's too restrictive to them. When somebody wants to have a relationship with God, but they want to keep on doing what they do, they don't follow Christ, they say that they're spiritual. You see what I'm saying? Here's the problem with that. According to Paul, unless you are a follower of Christ, unless you believe that Jesus is who he said he is, you can't be spiritual. Because only God, the Spirit is the Spirit of God. And who sent the Spirit of God into the world? Who announced that the Spirit of God would be coming at Pentecost? Who told the disciples, when the helper comes, when the paraclete comes, who said that? It was Jesus. If Jesus sent the Holy Spirit and Jesus is the Son of God, you cannot be spiritual without being a follower of Christ. That's not faulty logic. It says it in the verses we just read. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive the truths from God's spirit. If you don't have God's spirit, you are not spiritual. When someone says to you, I'm spiritual, you can look at him and smirk. No, don't do that. I'm just playing. But I'm saying, when someone says that, well, I'm spiritual, know what they're really saying. What they're really saying is, I want to be righteous, but I like being trifling. So I call myself spiritual so I can continue to get away with the stuff I want to get away with while maybe going to church sometime, praying sometime. That's what that means. That bothers me so much I had to point that out. Sorry, but a worldly spirit hinders prayer. Here's another one. The wrong motives hinder prayer. The wrong motives hinder prayer. A motive, of course, is the underlying reason why you do anything for any action. And our prayers are more likely to go unanswered if they are motivated by the wrong sources, like selfish desires. Look at what Proverbs chapter 16, verse 2 says. People may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their motives. In other words, human beings can operate from a variety of motivations, and a lot of them can be negative, like pride and anger and revenge or a sense of entitlement or the desire for approval from others that cause you to lash out and act out. Those can all be catalysts for our actions. But friends, any motivation that originates in our sinful flesh is not pleasing to God. Any motivation that you come up with, God ain't with it. Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. For the sinful, Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Listen, because our hearts are so deceitful, we should constantly evaluate our own motives and be willing to be honest with ourselves about why we are choosing a certain action. If an action you're choosing does not glorify God in your life, in your body, you shouldn't do it. That's the standard. I believe the bumper sticker version of that is, what would Jesus do? If Jesus wouldn't do it, as his followers, we shouldn't do it. It's a pretty simple rule to follow. It's a pretty simple mandate to get behind. When it comes to our motives in prayer, there's only one rule to follow, y'all. God wants us to pray for his will to be done. That your will be done this day on earth that it is in heaven, right? 
both in our lives and in the world. Because we can't impact what goes on in heaven, but we can impact what goes on in our lives and what goes on in the world. If you use that as your motivation, you're going to be well on your way to having your prayers succeed every time. Amen? So as we close this evening, my friends, I need for y'all to understand that we, again, we only covered two or three aspects of each hindrance or to prayer or barrier to prayer success. We didn't cover a lot of them. We could have covered a more. There are many, many other reasons why there may be barriers to your prayer life, which we didn't cover. For instance, wavering faith can hinder prayer your prayer life. Wavering faith, because whenever you doubt God's character or dependability, it can diminish your trust in him and therefore make it difficult to pray to him. Conflict in your relationships can hinder prayer. Look, we can't expect the Lord to answer our prayers if we're not treating other people the way he says that we should. The Apostle Peter outlines this pretty clearly in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, when he speaks about the role of husbands. Look at what he says there, 1 Peter 3, 7. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Hmm. Y'all hear that, husbands? You hear that, wives? Treat the spouse right. Don't be treating your spouse wrong and then praying and think God will hear your prayers. According to Peter, ain't happening. Here's something else. Idolatry can hinder prayer. As you know, idols are anything or anyone that takes the place of God in our lives, such as objects or ideas or habits. So if you're engaged in idolatry, then you're not giving God his rightful place in your life. And as such, don't expect your prayers to be heard. That's why 1 John chapter 5, verse 21 says, quote, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And 1 Corinthians 10, 14 is just as direct. It says, quote, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Friends, it is very clear that you only able to live righteously in God's sight if you're doing so through your faith in Christ Jesus. Otherwise, you got the wrong relationships and you're fooling yourself. Seriously. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 22. We are made right by, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. We got to know the Lord Jesus as our Savior. And God is our Father before we can be sure that our prayers are going to be heard and answered. We can't slack off in our prayer life or in our uh, spiritual life. We can't be spiritually careless. We can't do the things that will block our prayers or block us from praying. So if we want those prayers that we give up to the Lord, offer up to him to be effective like a sweet smelling fragrance, then we need to learn to kick over the hindrances to our prayer lives. We need to learn how to recognize and then eliminate any and all prayer barriers. Amen? But listen, you can't pray to a God that you don't know. And Jesus made it very clear that you can't know God unless you come to God through him as your Lord and Savior. Here's your chance to do that. Is there one? Won't you come? We are always so excited at this time to offer Christ to people because it is a life-saving moment. It is a life-changing moment. It is literally life or death. It really is. You go from dead in your sins and trespasses to alive in Christ. It's a matter of life and death. You go from being condemned to hell and spiritual death from God to life in Christ in heaven. It's life or death, y'all. And we got to treat it as such. And we got to help our family members and loved ones and friends see it as such as well. Don't let them get away with saying that they're spiritual and they're thinking they're going to get to heaven. You need to break the news to them. You ain't getting to heaven unless you believe in Christ. 
And that ain't you saying that. That's him saying that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you cite another authority. Don't cite your own authority when you witness to people. But you got to make sure that you are witnessing to people. Because the end could come at any time. And we want to make sure that we're working with the Spirit of God to try to help him bring as many people into the kingdom as possible. But you can't do it unless you're a part of the kingdom. That starts now. Is there one? Won't you come? We're always so thrilled at this time for no other reason than we know that the seeds have been planted. We're grateful to be in the business of planting seeds. We're grateful that God is in the business of germinating and causing seed to flourish. That's not our job. Our job is to plant it. Sit back and watch God do his thing. But plant it diligently, faithfully, and effectively. Meaning, do it consistently, do it persistently, with intentionality. Everything in our Christian walk has to be done with intentionality. You have to want to do these things. You have to have faith with intentionality. can have a halfway faith. That's not going to work either. These are all the things that create barriers to our relationship with God and create prayer barriers to him, him, him hearing from us. Amen.